What's good, everybody? Welcome to Believe in Celtics. I'm your host, Warren Shaw. Alongside me, as always, is the great Gary Washburn. Uh, Gary, what's good, brother? Good to see you out here on the NFL Wild Card Weekend. Yeah, everything's good. Everything's good. Uh, barely got out of Milwaukee to get back uh, to Boston for that game on Saturday, but was able to make it uh, through that you know, early snowstorm. Yeah. Um, so glad to be here. And um, it's the season's percolating, and we're getting to the NFL playoffs, like you said. And now we're kind of focusing from uh, college football to now college basketball. Yeah. Um, so that's some interesting. And, and if you're a 70 year old football coach, uh, you're out of work <laughs> uh, <laughs> over the last week because <laughs> a bunch of them have left. So, uh, very fascinating times we have in sports right now. Yeah, very, very much indeed. And and not that it, it doesn't impact the Celtics, you know, directly per se, but what is the, I guess, the sentiment around the town, obviously, with the situation with Belichick? I know we're crossing over here a little bit here, but just, you know, how does that impact like the kind of the sports town and feels like, all right, well, now the Celtics are the only hoop. I don't I'm not even following hockey, so I don't know if the ruins are good or not good. <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah. kind of like, what does that, because Bill was such a figure you know, within the Boston area for such a very, very long time. And to see it go the way that it's gone, just talk a little bit about your sentiment from that, you know, covering just sports in general in Boston. Yeah, it's captivated the city because obviously this is a Patriots town. I mean, when I moved here, um, the, the Celtics were, were, were third. And in many cases, at times they still are, but I think now they've kind of bumped up to number two or even number one because the Patriots are bad. Uh, and the Red Sox are coming off a couple of disappointing seasons, and they really haven't done much in free agency to excite the fans. So the, there's kind of a the, you have two fan bases that are kind of down, and where, and how honestly, the Celtics are playing great, great basketball the last couple of years, and then uh, the Bruins had the number one record in the league, the President's Trophy last year, lost the first round to your Florida Panthers, <laughs> and. Um, this year they're still very good, so they still have a chance to maybe go to the Stanley Cup. So it's become kind of a Celtics Bruins town, but obviously the the Belichick story has captivated the area because twenty five years and yeah. what should they do with them? And everybody had an opinion. Get get them the hell out of here. The people have thought they should fire him during the season. No, let them just you know let it let it go and let them coach and hire a new GM and. It's the players' fault and it's Belichick's fault. And um, how do you fire a coach who's won six Super Bowl? Like, oh, so the debates went on constantly. And I think everyone kind of saw over the last few days that uh, there was going to be some changes made. And, and then them naming Gerard Mayo, who is the polar opposite in terms of like a 37 year old African American uh, <laughs> former player. Uh, you know, and now you have uh, in, a, in, a, in a town that's had some of its issues, had, you know, two African-American coaches in football and basketball, and then uh, a Latino manager with Alex Cora with the Red Sox. So it just makes for an interesting um, kind of sports times here. And I think I, I haven't heard much uh, brushback, blowback on the hiring of Mayo in terms, not even it was race, not that, but just like he's inexperienced or yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I think people are excited about a fresh face. No more bad press conferences. No more just kind of a dictatorship. Uh, there, I think they're excited. And then, and then you know, with NFL, you get that number three pick. So everybody's looking at okay, who should you? Drake May, Caleb Williams, Marvin Harrison Jr. That generates also some excitement because. The Patriots don't have too many of those picks, uh, and we I think we've seen what the Celtics did with their number three picks, uh, Brown and Tatum. Um, so it's it's some exciting times, although, you know, not on the field, more off the field. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I don't know if there is a a basketball equivalent, but, I mean, would, would Pop be the closest thing to, yeah. to what Belichick was, you know, from the NBA standpoint? I mean, there were some other reporters, you know, for the Globe who were asking me, well, is, is Pop getting any, um, you know, heat from the Spurs being really, really bad? I mean, they just got, you know, Wimbyama, and they've had all these lottery picks over the last they few just years. Extended Pop over the summer. <laughs> yeah, and they extended him till he's 80, and I was like, honestly, no. There has been no 
in, in, you know, no brushback, no hot seat, no nothing in terms of, well, what what's going on? Why isn't Popovich coaching these guys to at least be competitive? Yeah. And I also think, Warren, the Detroit Pistons have helped that case because Detroit has been so bad that it's kind of taken the heat, in a sense, and the attention off San Antonio because San Antonio just went in there last week, as you saw, and beat the brakes off the Pistons. And, <laughs> and the Pistons were like, wait a minute. I think we, we thought we had a chance to win this game. But, oh, my God, we're getting outclassed by a team as bad as we are. So, yeah, uh, I, you're right. The the pop equivalent is there, but for whatever reason, and you know, maybe, you know, pop just does not get the heat. Yeah, no, yeah, I a thousand percent agree. And you know, I think for a lot of us who cover more closely the NBA, that would probably be the closest association. So it does make some sense. But interesting times in the city of Boston, and in some ways, allowing the Celtics to elevate a little, little bit here too. So we'll get into obviously our Celtics bulk of our conversation here. Um, but as always, make sure you got to do our plugs. So make sure you follow follow me at, at Shaw Sports NBA on X. Make sure you follow Gary at G Washburn Globe. Uh, make sure you check what he's doing out on the Boston Globe on a regular basis as well, too, in terms of his articles. Great, great content as always. And always a fun, fun post-game presses with him and Joe Mazzula. I always got to tap into those. <laughs> um, as always, follow Believe, I believe, um, on X. And I believe in sports as well, too. So, Gary, um, the week was interesting for Boston. Um, and we're going to kind of blend the whole kind of like what deal situation with, with the Celtics and kind of like one fail swoop, go a little bit of what they're going to be facing in the week ahead, a big MLK day, um, slate of games uh, coming up this week as we record, um, then a game against the Spurs, the aforementioned Spurs, and then a really big game against, you know, the Denver Nuggets at the end of the week, so to speak. Um, but one thing that I noticed for sure is that Tatum and Brown are heating up. <laughs> Like they they found their proverbial groove, and you know the the splits that they're doing right now, the the super level of efficiency that they're scoring at, in addition to still you know rebounding and 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 passing the ball, even making the extra pass. Tatum with the three point shot now also starting to fall as well too. But Brown has been over fifty percent. Tatum just under fifty percent. You know from the field. What can you say to the what's made that happen? Like what what's what's just the reps getting more comfortable with the new new teammates, so to speak. But I heard something even a post game pressure. You know, January Tatum is or January Jason, I guess is is a thing. I don't know where that came from. First, I've heard it, but at the end of the day, can you get such set some light into why the Jays are now really starting to find their groove here in January? Yeah, I give credit to Abby Chin from NBC Sports Boston for coming up with January Jason, and he <laughs> got a kick out of that. Um, I just think. Jason's one of those guys who just is, a, I don't want to say notoriously slow starter, but has been a slow starter in his career and is starting to warm up. And the three ball, he just seems more comfortable. And a lot of those shots that look like they were going to go down in uh, December and November are now going down. Mm-hmm. So it's I don't know if there's anything mechanically he's doing or anything that it's like, well, uh, he's changed his, uh, you know, spots on the floor or he's, getting the ball in different places or um, he's being more aggressive here. It just, the shots are going down. And I just think with Jason, that's the key because he attacks the rim a lot more than he did early in his career. And he's obviously got that step back two pointer. That is his patented, uh, one of his more reliable shots. It's just been the three. He shot 32% from the three in December and in six games in January, he's shooting 55% from three. And that includes that debacle in Milwaukee. So that includes that. That's not taking them that away. I mean, you know, we're not going to expect Jason to shoot 55% from three, but he's not a 32% shooter either. I think he's more near the 40 range when he's good. I know he shot 43% as a rookie. Um, he's kind of leveled off, but you don't want to see him at 34, 35. You'd like to see him in that 40 to 41 range, and if he's shooting 41%, and Jalen, in his last 20 games, Warren, 39% from three, he's shooting 39, you can't leave those guys alone, which opens more shots up for Derek White, for Drew Holiday, for Sassporzingas, Sam Hauser, Peyton Pritchard's really warmed up. So I I think that both of them have just decided, like Jalen's brought his A game almost from the beginning of, of the season. Better defender. If you watch the Houston game on Saturday, Warren, two blocks at the rim on Jabari Smith, like, you know, just like, no, you ain't dunking on me. Like, you know, 
Like that's the type of defense you need to see Jalen play. A good shutdown defense on Ant-Man in the third quarter in overtime in that game against Minnesota because Ant-Man um, was the best player. The first three quarters, he's the best player on the floor. Better than Jason, better than Jalen. Um, and and so uh, he Jason, with the scoring, was the best player on the floor in the fourth quarter in overtime. But Jalen's defense also helped win that game because Ant-Man was not the same after third quarter. So – if you get good defense from Jalen and good three point shooting, and 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 one thing we don't talk about a lot, Warren, that that you know and I know you're you're a numbers guy. Jalen hit thirteen for thirteen on from from the line against Minnesota. Like that's huge for him because he struggles from the line. Like he's not a fit, you know, he's not Andre Drummond or he's not Shaq, but he needs to be a more reliable free throw shooter because he's going to get to the line. You don't want to see him shoot. 71 percent he needs to be 78 79 okay he's never going to be 90 he's not going to be steve nash not going to be steph but you don't need you know 72 73 i think is too low especially for critical moments where he's going to need to sink both of them you don't you want him to be more reliable from the line so he shoot he hit 13 uh for 13 against minnesota um the three balls going down he's shooting with more confidence and rhythm He's not forcing them. And I think the most important thing, Warren, is they're not doing the, okay, my turn, okay, your turn. They're looking for each other at times. They're scoring on the floor of the offense. Jason knows Jalen is a hot player to open games. I'm going to let Jalen get his early. like Because we all know Jalen's one of the better players in the league in terms of scoring in the first quarter. He likes to, He likes the beginning of games. So – Jason will leave the game. He'll have three points, but Jalen will have 15, and they'll end up having the same amount because Jason's more of a closer. Jalen's Jalen can be a closer, but uh, Jason's kind of the team's closer now, um, and we'll see if that you know changes adjusts a little bit. I think it probably will. You know, give Jalen a shot here and there. Um, so I just think they're playing well together. They're the light is turned on for both of them. It's we're at midseason now. Mike yeah. Worth, you know, 39 games in. So this is no longer early. This is no longer a third of the way. You know, that game Wednesday will be the halfway point of the season, even though we're, what, a month from the All-Star break. So um, I think both are playing well together. The lights turn on for both. They're both, uh, if you knock on wood, both relatively healthy. Jason's had that ankle thing a little bit. And Jalen's, but Jalen's been... Uh, relatively, you know, mostly healthy. So I just think a whole combination of things have led to their resurgence and them coming, playing well together at the same time to where now they're unquestionably the best team in the league. So when they're on a, a kind of the heater that they're on here right now, you, you see why they're all NBA guys. You like you fully understand it. And I think going into the season, that was obviously the expectation. This is a championship level contending team, right? So you you have these two guys, not just all stars, all NBA level guys on top of it, right? So when you see them playing like this at this level, does it give you confidence to call them the best tandem in, in the league? Or are there others out there where that like you still feel like has a has the edge over them? They're among they're obviously in the conversation, but is there anything that you could say that would definitively make them so obviously winning a championship? But as we're doing regular season play, is there a tandem that you trust more than Jason and Jalen at this point? This year, no. Um, you know, because we can go down and we can look at, you know, uh LeBron and AD are both playing well, but they're not winning. So can you call them the best tandem? When they're whatever nineteen and twenty one, yeah. Uh, uh, Dame and Giannis, ups and downs. Um, when Dame is scoring, they're one of the best, obviously. But when Dame isn't scoring and and, and doesn't play great defense, the Bucks have struggled. So I can't definitively say Dame and Giannis. And so who else around the league? Um, you could say. PG and Kawhi, um, that's a comp, comp, but the Celtics without Kawhi, though, you know, the Celtics went in and beat the uh, Clippers by 37 in LA last month. So if you're looking at wins, overall numbers, um, just overall dominance, I got to say this year, they're the number number one duo 
I just don't, you know, there might be an overall better duo in April. You know, uh, you, the Clay Steph thing is gone. <laughs> um, yeah. that's, that's more Steph. Uh, if you look around the league, you know, it's, it, it, they are in their prime and they are doing um, great things. And, 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 and especially this year, they have, I mean, I think the, 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 the most important thing, Warren, is that in addition to the Porzingis, like the acquisition of Porzingis, Drew Holiday coming in, Derek White taking a step forward. We can talk about Derek White. I just did some numbers crunching and his number is over the last year and a half over that first 26 games in the playoffs are just night and day. It's like the Celtics got a new player uh, yeah. before last season, right? You can add all those together, but the fact is Jason and Jalen have both taken steps forward, and they're not taking more shots. It's not like you know Jalen's taking two fewer shots a game. That's why his scoring average is down. But he's more efficient. Same with Jason. Jason probably won't average 30 a game this year like he did last year. Good thing if you're a Celtic fan. Why? Because he doesn't need to take as much shot because he got more depth. They have more scoring. They have more people at the who can score at the rim. They have Porzingis. They have Hauser and Pritchard off the rim, off, sorry, off the bench. They have Drew Holiday who can hit, uh, who can score here and there, and you know can get to get you 16 to 20 points in a game. They have Derek White. They have so you don't want Jason to average 30, and then. In the playoffs, you know, everybody's trying to shut him down and it's, you're putting guys in positions to, to succeed and try to score when they're not there because teams are trapping Jason. You want every you want teams to look and be like, okay, who the hell are we going to guard? Right. Like Houston, Warren, was number five in the league in defensive, re, defensive rating before last night's game. Number five. They were 28 last year, okay? Shows you the impact of Ime Udoka. Right, shows you the impact of how great of a defensive coach he is. The Celtics scored 145 with Jalen not playing the fourth quarter and Jason getting to throw the hell out of the game a minute and a half in the fourth quarter and didn't score the fourth quarter. Right, it scored 145 points on them without the with those two factors. So this offense is kicking is it's it's in the high gear, fifth sixth gear now. I don't think there's a six gear car. There might be one <laughs> out there, maybe in Europe or something. Uh, and it's because everyone is clicking. Porzingis, White, Holiday, and that has helped Jason and Jalen take the next step too. Yeah, I think all extremely great points there. You know, from from the Celtic standpoint, and you know, interesting as those the two leaders. You know, I think both offensively, mo mostly offensively, but, you know, in terms of what their overall leadership is supposed to be for this roster, they really kind of step into that gear, as you're alluding to, Joe empowering them, challenging them to, you know, to do more even than just score. And as you alluded to, Jalen taking even that 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 next step in terms of defensive evolution. So when you have all those guys out there who can all defend as well, too, this team really is doing something that is, you know, um, that can be special if they can keep it together and obviously stay healthy. Let's talk a little bit about just the week that was a couple of controversial things. You already touched on it in terms of, you know, Tatum being, being ejected um, uh, much earlier, I guess, last week. Now, you know, we haven't recorded in a while, but then, you know, the whole foul on Jalen situation, you know, at the end of the end, Indiana game as well, too. <laughs> a lot of stuff. With the <laughs> Give him a haircut. Uh, <laughs> I hit the cornrows, incidental contact. <laughs> you, you didn't feel that. Get, you know, it's like you're, I mean, when you fell down, you was a kid. You didn't feel it. Get, get up. You ain't, you ain't get here. up. Get up. <laughs> Rub some dirt get up. up. You're fine. Ain't nobody. Ain't nobody. You ain't, ain't nothing wrong with you, boy. Yeah. But where, 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 where do they stand now, right? So what I'm gonna, sorry, what I'm gonna bleed this into here is that to me that they've, we've seen this team like kind of struggle with adversity, you know, previously. Um, for whatever that is. Uh, so whatever adversity they face don't always bounce back. But when they've had tough losses, when the refs, you know, are against them, so to speak, and things aren't going this way, they they seem to be able to respond this year. What's happening in that that sense of the locker room where that adversity is not really sticking to them that it had in, in like the way that it did in years past? Yeah, I just think um, an overall maturity and savvy knowing that there's another game and you can't focus on what you can't control. And I think they were still very upset about what happened in Indiana. So you walk away from that and you you hope just for the, the sake of any sports fan, any fan, NBA fan, that that doesn't affect it to where 
they lose the wet to East by one game to Milwaukee, and then everybody points to that game and goes, see, the Celtics come back two nights later, get pushed to overtime, but able to beat and come back and beat Minnesota. I thought that was a fantastic comeback considering the the, the Wolves pretty much had them, 109-102, well, I think three after uh, Nikhil Alexander-Walker hits a quarter three. He had, I mean, it, the, the, the Wolves, the night we talk about this, Warren, was a pretty damn good team. So for the Celtics to overcome that, and to win in overtime, and Jason goes for 45. Just, I thought that was one of the more important wins of the year because you don't want to go two straight losses going to Milwaukee where they got clubbed. You know, um, I just think that game they had no energy, no legs, no nothing. And you know, the Bucks two days off, embarrassing home loss to Utah where they trailed by literally 33 points in the first half. Like a lot of just factors to where Milwaukee was like. Yeah, bring them brothers on. We, yeah. we we ready. You know, full day of practice, hearing how they've they've been one of the disappointments in the league. Adrian Griffin, is he the right coach? And all this. And they 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 just Dame hit two threes in the first 90 seconds. I'm like, okay, this is gonna be a problem. I think it was yeah. eleven to two. It was eleven to two. Malik Beasley hitting 30 footers. I'm like, yeah. That's one of those nights that um, you just got to tip your cap and throw in the towel and walk off the floor and just try to, you know, just get get ready for another day. Um, so I thought the Minnesota win was was quality win. And then coming back and, and getting that game against Houston, convincingly 32-point win. Um, so a, a lot of things going on with this team. But I think the bounce back from the Indiana game was good. And then Tatum getting tossed against Houston. We'll see if he gets another additional fine simply because he didn't leave the court in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. He went to CJ Washington, the official, and like pointed at him. That might get him a you know 10 G's or something like that. Jason doesn't, Jason's not in the Dray, Draymond Green, Marcus Smart hierarchy of fines. He's not in that neighborhood yet. But they might say, throw Jason a little bit of a warning and say, Jason, when you get tossed. You don't walk up to the, the – don't, don't, don't just get off the floor. Yeah. And so uh, – but I think, like, the difference between this team and the EMA team is they do – they don't bitch at the referees as much. And I think that's the thing. Even though Jason does sometimes, and Jalen, you know, uh, Chris Stapp's got a lot of technicals early and has cut down on those. Um, they don't bitch at the referees as much. And I think – in all honesty, Warren, I think some of that has to do with the absence of Marcus Smart. Yeah, I mean, and I think at some point you have to under rely on your talent. I know Jason was saying a lot of, you know, I have to stand up for myself yeah, as a, as a, you know, as a superstar in the league per se. And I know he does the wave off, you know, all the time and gets teased, you know, for that for that that specific thing a lot. But let's close this part of the conversation out really quickly in the aspect of. Do you feel, in essence, Tatum is properly respected, if you will, you know, by the referees in terms of the hierarchy, in terms of superstar calls, or do you feel like I don't want to, I don't want to be prisoner of the moment, you know, with last night because clearly <laughs> he was clearly fouled, right? Clearly, but the, do you feel like he doesn't get enough of those calls, or is he constantly getting hit? And I think there's a lot of superstars going to say, "Oh, I get hit every time," but where do you think Tatum is in, the, in that aspect of the hierarchy of superstars when it comes to referees and the respect that he's paid? When it comes to their calls, yeah, I think he's I think he's gotten the respect, but I think one of the reasons Warren why his scoring average is down is that he's taken a, a free throw and a half uh, fewer per game. Also, his free throw percentage was once eighty five percent, eighty six percent, eighty five percent, a premium free throw shooter. This year, eighty one percent, and that might not seem like a lot, but that's not that's that's a, that's a little bit of a difference. Jason has not been the, the the great free throw shooter he usually is this year. He's missed 48 free throws this year in 36 games. So Jason's got to step his game up a little bit with his free throw shooting. But I also think he's going to the line less. Um, you know, taking fewer shots. I don't think he's. Oh, I'm not going to put. Oh, he's getting screwed and, and yeah, no. after him. No, 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 no. no. But I do think there's some times where he gets hit and they don't call it or it looks like a clean block. And he, you know, he's got shoulders and arms and everything moving everywhere. 
let's be honest, Warren, sometimes it's just freaking hard for the official to see it, to see the contact like that um, going to the rim when he's spinning and turning. Because Jason is not a bulldozer when he goes to the rim. He definitely uses his body to shift to avoid contact. Now, if he went to the rim like, it, you're going to pay the price for getting in front of me. Like I am going to, I am going to knock your teeth out. Like you know, nobody gets in front of LeBron. When you see LeBron coming, you, you yeah. make a well, even, to, even to a lesser degree, like a guy like Julius Randle, like he's, yeah. he's oh looking. yeah, you, yeah, Julius, yeah, you ain't you ain't doing that. Yeah. You you making you not getting a knee to the chest, right? Like you want to, you want to live to fight another day. Um, you want to <laughs> you want to be healthy. So Jason, more or less, although he's six ten, you know, shifts and turns his body and tries to, you know, lay it in without with minimal contact. And I think that might have something to do with it too. And then, so if you see it, it you you might not see the body contact. So he's relying on arm contact as opposed to like you got him with with your body. So I think a lot of that it comes into it. I, I, you know, are there some calls he should get? Yes. Is he getting screwed by the referees? No. Was that some questionable officiating yesterday, Saturday? Yes. I also think Warren. We, you know, it's been some bad officiating this year all around the league. That Indiana game was abysmal, and that was a quality veteran staff. Hmm. That was James Williams, Tom Washington. That was not. A rookie staff. You can look at some of these new referees, and when you don't recognize the name, because remember, um, to our viewers and listeners, like the Joey Crawfords, the Steve Javies, all those guys left. Um, yeah, those personalities, Monty, big personalities. Yeah, Monty McCutcheon, the real vets, the Monty McCutcheons all retired over the last five to eight years. So there's an influx of new officials in the league. Some of these officials are literally in their still in their 20s. Some are 32, and you don't remember in, in our NBA, our father's NBA, 30-year-old officials. You, the officials were gray-haired and, you know, hey, get, that's a foul. You know, get down the court. Get out of my, you know. Those were the officials that we grew up with. Those are not the new officials now. The uh, What's the older guy that, that uh, tried to race Charles Barkley uh, at the All-Star game? Um, Dick Pavetta. Dick Pavetta. Those, those guys are gone. Okay, <laughs> Dick Vivette's still around, but he's no longer, you know, it's good to see Joey Crawford around working with the league and all this, but, but those guys are gone. There's a whole new Jack of uh, Jack, new, new Jack City, new Jack of uh, refs, and those guys are going to make mistakes until they get, um, until they get veteran help, until they get, sorry, more years in, more experience, yeah. and get more, less sensitive, and some of these guys are sensitive. The Zach Zarbas and all, they'll do every game. So some of those, when you look at the score sheet before the game and you see somebody, you're like, I don't recognize this. It could be some going, it, you look, you're like, it could be something going on tonight because I these are two officials I've never seen or never heard of. Like C.J. Washington, don't real not real familiar with him. Um, yeah. You know, I'd have to look up his bio. I'm sure it's not his first season, but there's a whole line of new refs and so that's kind of what's causing this too. Makes a lot of sense. Let's let's close out the segment here. Three games up, you know, for our, our recording purposes, if you will. I guess they played next weekend as well, too. But um, Toronto, MLK, San Antonio, and then um, the game against the Denver Nuggets. Not that those those two games in the middle of the week, beginning of the week are not important, but at the end of the day, um, we've we've seen those teams already. Kind of know what to expect from them. You know, obviously seeing Toronto, I guess, for the final time, I think, for the season here now. Um, but Denver, you know, the Nuggets are starting, well, started to turn the corner here a little bit. Jokic has still been Jokic, MVP level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jamal Murray back healthy, so to speak. Um, what can we expect for that game? And can the Celtics look at it as, you know, as a litmus test to some degree, as the finals that, that should have been, you know, last year that obviously did not happen, come to fruition because of the Miami Heat? You know, shout out to their, what they did in essence to kind of get that Eastern Conference finals in seven games. Uh, but is a Denver matchup something that Boston can or should be looking forward to on Friday? Very much so. But, Warren, got to take care of the first two games. Toronto is going to play better at home. And remember, it's the first game we've played the Raptors 
since the Barrett Quigley trade. Those are two guys that are very familiar with the Celtics. The Raptors are very familiar with the Celtics. There's been some beef this year with those those two teams. So we'll see what happens at MLK Day in Toronto. That's a tricky game. That's not, you know, when Scotty Barnes played playing well. You know, the, the Raptors are a team that has the talent, but sometimes it just doesn't show up. Um, so if you're the Celtics, you like to take care of business there. The same thing with San Antonio. Now, I don't think the Spurs are going to come in and beat the Celtics, but give yourself a night off there. Punch them first, punch them second, get a big lead, make it give you give yourself some time off there. The Denver game, I said tough game. Denver's coming in. Um and, and Denver is a team, like you said, is just starting to pick it up. They've they've had their ups and downs. I know, you know, last time I looked, they had, were getting whooped up by Oklahoma City at home, but they have taken the turn for the better. Uh, Jamal Murth- Murray, I think, is starting to get a little bit more, get a little bit healthier. Yep. So there's a lot to like about Denver. And I'm looking at Denver, um, you know, and they get two days off before that Celtic game. So they're not coming off a of back-to-back. That's kind of a – that's a big deal. Philadelphia on Tuesday, then they don't play again. So they'll they'll be in Boston for three nights, uh, you know, before that, before that ball game tips off because it's the beginning of a West Coast – or the oh, sorry East Coast road trip for them, so I think they they've got to be on their on their game on their game. I mean, Denver has still has so many weapons. Um, if I'm looking here, they've won 11 of their last 14, uh, and, and you know, lost at Utah, who's start who suddenly started to play better when they got their when they got crushed by the Celtics. They've been a different team. Uh, they. The Nuggets lost to Oklahoma City and Orlando in that span, but wins over New Orleans. They beat Indiana on Sunday, uh, beat the Warriors, and they've had kind of a softer schedule in that stretch. But 11 out of 14 is 11 out of 14. So they got to be ready for that game. They got to be ready for Jokic, ready for Jamal Murray splashing threes, ready for Michael Porter Jr., you know, ready for Reggie Jackson, ready for that team to take to take them to another level, and let's see if the Celtics can bounce back and play well against them. Not bounce back, but bounce, respond like they did against Minnesota, um, because those teams are gonna, th- those teams are coming for them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll really quickly, you know, just kind of fast forwarding everything you said. Very true about the beginning part of the week. But I think what I'll be looking for towards the end of the week, assuming everybody is going to play in that game, is just how do they guard Jokic, and 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 what waves do they do they do that? Obviously, he's one if not the best player in the nba one of you know there's not too many more than him um because if you double him he obviously he's adept at passing uh, but do they try to play him straight up is that al's assignment is that kp's assignment like what happens is that a game where we see kita does he get in there just to like soak up some minutes just to kind of get ish body you know against him those are the things i've been looking to kind of see and then obviously as you alluded to the michael porters of the world and jamal murray's who um again play good basketball in our, in our, in our size, they have big size. So what do, what do Derek and Drew do against some of those guys that obviously Tatum and Brown too, against the Porters and Aaron Gordon as well too, not to forget him and the great, again, he's, he's, he's so perfect in that role for Denver. It, it doesn't make sense. He was miscast as a number one option now as a number four, yeah, whatever totally, you want to call him option in Denver. Totally. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's almost, he's almost, um, he's a star in his role here now, and it's just a luxury that Denver has, you know, in that capacity. So we'll see what the week brings for, for Boston going into it. Coming up, we'll kind of go whip around the association here with my guy, G Money. But as always, make sure, again, you follow him at G Washburn Globe, follow me at Hot Sports NBA. We'll take a quick break here on Believe in Celtics, and we'll be right back. Are you ready to step up your style without compromising the planet? Introducing the exciting partnership between Blue View Footwear and the 19 Media Group Network. Just visit bit.ly backslash BlueView19 to start your sustainable style journey. Our friends over at BlueView Footwear are renowned for introducing the world's first fully biodegradable sneaker. By using plant-based plastics, they are leading a revolution in cleaner materials and manufacturing. They have sleek and contemporary styles that cater to a wide range of tastes. BlueView Footwear believes that fashion and sustainability can coexist harmoniously. Explore their incredible collection of eco-friendly footwear by visiting bit.ly backslash blueview19. If you let us know you made a purchase, we'll shout you out on our next show. Again, just visit bit.ly backslash blueview19 today and you'll see the ultimate collaboration of fashion, sustainability, and media excellence. And we're back here on Believe in Celtics. 
Um, we're going to do our little segment here with my guy, G Money, because, you know, we're, we're big fans of the league itself, not just covering the Celtics specifically. So in this edition of Around the Association, we're going to kind of stick to what we've been doing here. Three main topics. And the first one we're going to kind of discuss here, G, is that debacle in Chicago. Uh, the Bulls out here trying to show homage and respect as an organization, you know, to the, the team, the players, the management that had done so much to, to give the Bulls, you know, the, the, the standing that they have in NBA history. Um, and a kind of de a deplorable scene there, uh, you know, with Mr. Krause's widow. Just what happened there? You know, for those who know, like the, the fans just booed when, when Jerry Krause's picture and image came on the screen. And it's to understand that, yes, we saw the last dance and no, there was a lot of things that maybe people didn't care for Mr. Krause um, and how he handled the roster and, and even the, ult the ultimate ending of, of that, of those great bulls teams, but pay some respect, I guess, to the dead, you know, and, and, and really to somebody there to honor his memory because good, bad, or indifferent, they have championships because of what he's done and what he did. So it was a, it was a rough scene to kind of witness from afar, but you being tied in and, and, and maybe even some some knowledge with, um, you know, some other uh, reporters there. What have you gleaned from that situation and, and why it went down the way that it did? Yeah, tough situation, Warren, because forgiveness is part of professional sports. And, you know, being in Boston, um, you know, not before I got here, like, you know, they blame Bill Buckner for decades for that ball that went through his legs that led to the winning run in game six. Now, you can blame all you want, but the Red Sox won and lost game seven, too, to the Mets. Like, people don't really talk about that. That did not end the series. That just ended that game. They were one out from getting their first World Series since 1918. So, and Buckner, unfortunately, who passed away, came back to Fenway and was given a standing O because it was like we're so, – like, We've held, and, and since then they had won titles. Yeah. So the fan base softened. And I think it was like, you know what? In hindsight, it was not all your fault. You made a mistake. You tried. You had bad knees. You, you know, you got us there. We're sorry. And he comes back, and I think he's got emotional because it had been something that stuck with him for years. And I remember Vince Carter going back to Toronto. And remember, he asked out of Toronto. He wanted out. And they gave him a standing O because it was just like, you know what, man, you asked out, but damn it, what you did for Canadian basketball, the R.J. Barrett's and the Say Gills Alexanders and all these guys like Kelly Olynyk and uh, the Nikhil Alexander Walker guy just talked about all Canadian, they they don't probably play NBA basketball or basketball without you being on this roster and making the Raptors. Uh, a must see and that 2000 dunk contest and what you did for Toronto basketball and making other free agents want to come to Toronto and then yeah. winning a time like thank you so they got over it so unfortunately it just seems like the last dance and I know we were all desperate to watch something during the pandemic and it was sad because Kraus Jerry Kraus the general manager broke up and, and I don't know if young people can relate to this because it wouldn't probably happen today Warren like he broke up a championship team. Like usually championship teams are allowed to lose on the floor. Yeah. I mean, right? the Warriors right yeah. now, right? <laughs> allowed to lose on the floor. It's over. Our dynasty is done. It happened to the Celtics, gave it to the Pistons. The Pistons gave it to the Bulls. The Lakers, um, you know, took it, finally took it from the Spurs and won three. Like, Everybody has a run, and every run ends, and usually it's on the floor. With that, the 98 Bulls, there was no 98-99 Bulls. Jerry Krause decided he was going to fight, let, let Phil Jackson go. He decided he was going to hire Tim Floyd, who was a kind of a college coach, who, but he thought he was going to be the next, you know, next coming of the great, uh, you know, one of the great coaches of all time. He, he, he really loved Tim Floyd. It didn't work out. And he decided he wanted to start over, start from scratch, get draft picks in there, start, you know, remember Tyson Chandler and Eddie Curry were supposed to be the one-two punch. Um, 
you know, that never worked out that way and all that, right? And remember, and people don't remember, the 98-99 NBA season, there was a lockout. And it was only 50 games. And people thought that people thought that there was not going to be a season in 98-99. Like, it was a kind of a changing of the guard where you had a lot of issues with, you know, salaries, obviously, um, conduct of players, all this was going down. And you had a lot of older players representing, I remember Patrick Ewing, guys who were literally going out, but trying to get their, get theirs. A full, so they were trying to figure out what kind of deal should we do? Should we help out the young guys who are coming in or should we watch out for ourselves? And a lot of people thought that that those players, kind of the older players on that players association, now it's much younger, right? Jalen Brown, Grant Williams, C.J. McCollum, who might be 30 right now. Like back then it was a bunch of old guys on that committee. They kind of went for themselves, and so it caused labor strife. So you're asking Michael Jordan at age 36 to come back for an abbreviated season with all the rest of the guys, Pippen, who's in decline, uh, Luke Longley, uh, Dennis Rodman, who's starting to lose it too, like, and try to repeat. Well, Krauss wanted no part of that. And you could say, well, that's smart. Or you could say, how the hell do you break up a team with Michael Jordan? Yeah. Everybody thought that way. And, it, and so the last dance brought all that back. And even for new fans, who were like born, were two years old at the time, they d develop a uh, dislike for Jerry Krause because of how the B last dance is portrayed. And Jerry wasn't a great guy. He's not a guy you're going to, the first guy in your list you're going to invite to your party. Jerry was a curmudgeon. He was an old crotchety GM, like a lot of GMs. Mm -hmm. All the, you look at GMs now, and these guys look like freaking GQ models and stuff like that. <laughs> that was not the case. It was red all or bad. It true. was it was Jerry Crowley. These guys were not supermodels. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Brad Brad Pitt was not running no NBA team <laughs> in the 1990s, right? Now these guys look different. <laughs> okay, most I'm a former player. They take good care of. Them. Back then, Kraus looked like a guy you didn't like. He looked like a very unlikable guy, and for him to kind of take the thing from Phil Jackson, for him to say, remember, Michael Jordan was a free agent. What do you pay Michael Jordan? Do you bring him – obviously, whatever the hell he wants, but do you sign him to a one-year deal? Do you sign everybody back, put off the rebuild for another year? They decided to go to hit, go, go tank, basically. They got Tyson Chandler and Curry, as I talked about. It didn't work out. They had number one and number two pick, and they – and, you know, we can – like – Chandler ended up having a nice NBA career, never really a perennial all-star, and Curry kind of ate himself out the league yeah. um, and, and just was not – Curry was compared to Shaq. If you remember that, I mean, Curry kind of <laughs> compared to Shaq. And he won Shaq. <laughs> um, so I just think it was terrible, Warren, for them to blue. Is He died in 17. You know what? Give him He put the team together. Let bygones be bygones. Let it go. It, it's 25 years. I think the Bulls folks thought it's been 25 years, but obviously you know, I think a lot of the younger fans who watch The Last Dance and have seen it because it's been replayed on ESPN now 44 times over, you know, like – It's on Netflix, yeah. Yes, you can watch it whenever you want now, have grown to dislike Jerry Krause and never knew anything and didn't know the specifics of him drafting Johnny Scottie Pippen Sorry, trading for Scottie Pippen on draft night for freaking Olden Polybees, signing Dennis Rodman when Dennis was tripping in Detroit and about to kill himself and taking a chance on him, getting Ron Steve Harper. Yeah. Ron Harper who blew up his knee when he was in Cleveland. If if people would think Ron Harper is a slow, Ron Harper was a, a he was a baller. <laughs> he was a baller <laughs> at yeah. Miami of Ohio in his early years in Cleveland. He was. Nothing nice. He was Shea Gillis Alexander. He was a scoring machine. Then he blew out his knee. And so he became a occasional scorer and solid plus defender. He changed himself. 
you take chances with all those guys trading Oakley for Bill Cartwright. And Oakley obviously had a nice career in New York, but Cartwright was part of those teams. Luke Longley, people, who is this guy? Some big, awesome, awesome, like, all this worked. So you got to give him credit for the six championships. And you can't boo him because Michael Jordan doesn't like him. And I don't think Jordan helped the situation at all. And I think it was a bad idea if you're going to have a ring of honor for Jordan and Pippen not to show up, but you knew they weren't going to show up. Pippen, Pippen's the most unpopular man on that team. He's bad-mouthed everybody because he's how he's betrayed in the last dance. And Jordan, unless it's really worth his while, ain't showing up. He did a nice video, but Jordan got other things to do, even though he's not an owner anymore. I think the Bulls felt like, okay, you're not affiliated with Charlotte anymore. Uh, and Jordan was like, no, it's okay. I, I got other stuff to do. And so just the overall bad idea, unfortunately. And as we learn, and I've learned in Boston, when you try to do these reunions, and it's in like in music too, and it's always one person, one member of the group that don't want to be part of it. There's always a lead singer or the drummer, or you know, it's always one person who's like got a beef and then from 20, 25, 30 years ago, and you don't like we always please get back together. And it's just like, no, I don't have any interest. Like in Boston, Robert Parrish, you know. Didn't come back to many. He came back to, like, I think Garnett's retirement jersey. But a lot of the reunions, he has no interest in coming back. Well, why not? What well, He felt like the Celtics um, should have given him the same employment opportunities as they did Danny Ainge. He felt yeah. like they should. He felt, he felt like he should have been employed like Kevin McHale was around the league, and he wasn't. So we learned that the, there's beefs. And we tell our young people, you know, hey, get over that stuff. Don't, don't, and, and you got all this old stuff. Like some of these, some of us older folks and need to, you know, get over these beefs too. And in professional sports, as you know, Warren, some of these guys have long memories. Um, and that's what happened. You hope his wife is okay. Hopefully Jordan and others reached out to his wife, maybe privately and said, hey, we're sorry. Because Jordan should have, Jordan made, and I know we made fun of him and we clowned him and we, you know, he was a fat guy and he was 5'4", and, uh, you know, like, uh, we get it, Michael. It's low-hanging fruit, man. It really, really is. Like, sometimes you just, it's uh, this low-hanging fruit we have from social media, whenever someone has a flaw, we're going to just beat up on them for it. And and it's just not fair. It isn't like it's sad. Yeah, that was devastating. It was it was it was heart, heartbreaking to watch. And you know, whatever happens in the aftermath, I think as you alluded to, if hopefully there's some professionalism that the organization and the members of that team that are still with us, uh, hopefully they'd reach out on the side. And maybe we 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 never we may never know that, and we may not need to. But hopefully the right things are now happening behind closed doors because yeah, that was a rough rough scene. I think it was a. You know, a mark on on the Bulls organization in general, and not to say the organization, I guess, because they tried, but definitely that fan base. Um, and what was starting to be a, a better year as they've turned it around on the actual basketball court with the iteration of the team that they have here now. So we'll see how things go from there. You touched on this earlier in the show here, G Money. Uh, that obviously a trade happened. The Detroit Pistons, you know, move on from from Marvin Bagley. I'm just I'm amused by the whole situation because I've been so confused by the Pistons when they re-signed them anyway, I was like, why do you have so many front court players? Like what is happening here? And now they ultimately uh, move him over to Washington. Um, <laughs> Mike Muscala and Danilo Gallinari, you know, two former Celtics, ironically had a cup of coffee. Uh, they go over there. It'd be interesting to see if they end up getting bought out, you know, two, two second round picks as well go over in that deal. Um, anything to make of this deal? I know you touched on here a little bit earlier, but more so I want to bleed into, do you think not that this trade is the catalyst of anything, but, are you hearing other chatter out there that this might be an active trade, trade season in general? Yeah, I think it's the start of some things. I think in Detroit, uh, focus on this trade real quick. Detroit's just trying to clear cap space for this summer. I think they saw what, what Houston has done, where they basically overpaid for Fred Van Vliet and they overpaid for Dylan Brooks because that's what Detroit's going to have to do to get guys to play there because mm -hmm. no one's going to want to play there going 3-35. and 35. So – they saw the, the the rapid improvement that Houston made. I think they're 18, 19, and 19 now. Um, quality playing uh, potential, right? Uh, by spending, you know, 40 million on Van Vliet and 20 million 
per on Dylan Brooks, which was overpaying on both guys. Let's be let's be honest. We love Fred Van Vliet. He's not a forty million dollar a year player, but to get him to Houston, that's what you're going to have to pay him. And to get free agents to Detroit, you're going to have to overpay them because it's Detroit with very little history in terms of. And I'm not talking about long term history. I'm talking about recent history. Okay, don't. You know, you, you Piston fans, don't bring up 04. We get it. That's 20 years ago. I'm sure they're about to have a reunion, just like the Bulls did. Hopefully it goes a little bit better and bring that damn team back because it's been 20 years. Okay, so recent history. Um, in Washington, I think they're just trying to take a look at Bagley, need some front court help. Isaiah L Livers um, is a good is – a, is a solid wing player, solid like eighth, ninth man. I think he's got some potential – so nothing to lose for Washington. Dow Gallinari and Muscala were not going to help them do anything. Yeah. Now, what's interesting now is that if those guys get waived, especially Gallinari, the Celtics could try to bring him in because now the, it's it's he, he's a team removed. So let's see what happens there. If he's that, you know, if they want a, a more of a stretch guy who could, doesn't need to play a lot of minutes. Maybe maybe that's something, and I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm sure if he's healthy and the knee is sound, and they wanted to play, they would have. I think it would have made a difference last year on that team. Maybe they bring him in and say, "Hey, you're you know, you, there's going to be times you might play in the second unit and stretch the floor for us. Hit hit a couple of threes. Can you do that for us? If not, you're at the minimum. You're a leader. You're so you're a mentor for some of these guys. You probably you know have played." With Chris Stapps uh, in, in international ball and all that, maybe maybe you can have you know maybe uh, you know you can have a good positive impact. And you were you were a fine teammate when you were here, and you you know missed the season with a knee injury. So I do think it's going to be an active trade season, Warren. I think this is just a start. Watch out for guys like Zach for Levine, Alex Caruso. What, see what the Bulls do. The Lakers, I think, are going to have to make a move. Um, they are just not a good ball club. And all those guys they brought in, the Jared Vanderbilts, the D'Angelo Russells, the Rui Hachimuras, the Gabe Vincents, just aren't good enough. The Torian, they're not consistent. They got a bunch of guys from other places that haven't been consistent, and then they haven't been consistent in L.A. And I know playing for the Lakers will bump you up and make you feel like a million dollars because you're playing in the, the one of the sports meccas and great franchise, but some of these guys ain't for playing in L.A. And I just think that with LeBron and AD being all mostly healthy, putting up the big numbers, you got to do something because the, the windows close. So look for the Lakers uh, to make a move. Look for Indiana to make a move because I think they have a chance for like a chance to compete. And look for the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat, and you know down there, Miami, they've been lurking. They've been winning, shutting the hell up, resting Jimmy for the playoffs. Yep. Like, Jimmy, you don't That's care about no – you don't care about no awards, do you? No, nope. we're going to play you about 55 games this year. Okay, we're going to give you a real, you got, oop, you got a little boo boo. Okay, take five games off. We're going to get the rookie, Jami Haquez. We're going to get him ready. We're going to get Haywood Highsmith ready. We're going to get Josh Richardson back into the system. And by the time the playoffs come around, we're going to be ready. I think that's what Miami is saying. They're a team nobody wants to play, especially Boston. And then, they have the, the, some of the assets that they didn't use for Dane Lillard to try to maybe improve at the trade deadline. So watch the Miami Heat. Last one before I get out of here. So, and we'll kind of roll it into kind of one overall topic. Draymond Green reinstated here and, and will make his return to the Warriors um, tomorrow, I guess, um, as we're recording the show. Uh, but in general, what do you think about the Warriors and what, what they're ultimately going to do when it comes trade market? So, I mean, they'll have about roughly a month before the trade deadline here, or maybe a little under a month here now, right? Um, Draymond comes back. Do they wait to kind of see what does he do over the next five games? Does that improve the chemistry before they decide to do anything drastic? Yeah, I think, though, I think so. But I also think Steph Curry made an interesting comment, like you can't do the same thing the same way. Uh, that's insanity. You know, I think he's kind of looking at the organization like, okay, guys, like we got to do something here. Like if we're going to squeeze the last little drops out this out this dynasty, right? Like if you're the Warriors, here's what you, you want to go out fighting, okay? Yeah. You want to go out. Okay, if you lose in the second round to Minnesota, Denver, okay, you went down, but not making the play-in, not making the playoffs at all. Losing that playing first, that, that's that's failure. 
So I think they're going to make the moves. And, you know, it's like, well, who they have to trade? Like, I think Chris Paul's expiring contract. Um, I think they're probably going to have to part with one of their young guys. Do they move a Kuminga? Because that's what they're going to ask for to get Pascal Siakam or guys in there that make an impact. They're going to say, okay, we got you. We want Kaminga, and, hey, that Trace Jackson Davis guy ain't bad either. So are you willing to give up your youth and go through some real hard times after Steph leaves? And because, and then what do you do with Clay? If Clay's like, listen, I'm not coming back for anything less than $40 million, do you move Clay? Because he's got an expiring contract. It might be, have to be some, this is going to hard to, <laughs> I think there's a reason why Bob Myers got the hell out, Warren, yeah, yeah. And, because he saw this team was in decline. And you people, how could you see, you know, we did, we thought the Warriors would compete this year. When you see a team every day and people want to always argue with opinions of beat writers, we see the team every day. You can tell when a team is not together, cohesive, or they're losing it. And I think Bob Myers being a GM looked at that team and said, I don't see it. I don't see it. And there's some hard decisions that need to be made. And now he's went to the roster and commanders and got a consulting job there, got the hell out of TV. That it, you know, he bounced bounced real quick. So I think you give them some time. The West is a kind of a crapshoot in the middle, and you try to see what you can do. And you try to see what's out there in the trade market. But it might be have to be some tough decisions made. Is is Clay the one to go? An expiring contract, a guy who still wants to play but wants to play at a certain amount of money, do you say, okay, Clay, we're going to get some assets for you, and you try free agency and see what happens? I I can't wait. <laughs> I do. I mean, I think it's going to be such – an interesting situation here in the next in the coming weeks and you know mike dunleavy jr now running that that organization and what is he tied to and and, and in what capacity um and does he see literally the writing on the wall and how does he want to react to it and respond to it but i agree with you a thousand percent i do think it's going to be a fairly active trade season here so while marvin bagley moving over to washington doesn't isn't necessarily earth shattering i think you're starting to see teams trying to put themselves in the right position whatever that position may ultimately be for them individually that'll do it for this week's edition here of believe in celtics lots of great conversation as always that we got into uh, make sure you follow gary at g washburn globe as always make sure you're reading his work over at the boston globe you follow me at shaw sports nba and as always you can follow believe at their respective social handles as well too that'll do it here for believe in Celtics. i alluded to man we'll catch you next week peace Thank you.